why they're in church. The, the ones who are biblically literate may know that Hebrews 10.25 says to not forsake the assembling together. So to try to obey God, they're, they're in church. Uh, some are just there because a, a loved one or a friend brought them. Or it's a family tradition that they go to that denomination. And for some, it may just be that they've been part of a group for a long time and they're not convinced that God has told them to go somewhere else or to stop going. So it's just a habit. Now, none of those are bad reasons. Um, and some are fairly good reasons. But you know, good is the enemy of excellent. Because it was good Christians who enslaved black Africans for 250 years. It was good Germans who looked the other way while the Nazis put Jews and gypsies and mentally challenged people in the gas chambers and exterminated them. And being a good Christian will not prevent you from caving in to persecution or temptation from the enemy. I, I've had that happen to me several times. I mean, back in 1971, I was part of the uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Eastman School of Music in Rochester, New York. I'd been born again, as far as I can tell, for about a year before that. I went to Bethel Assembly of God Church every Sunday morning. But you know, when I started trying to witness to some of my classmates, a bunch of Yankees, uh, that were a bunch of free-thinking atheists, they just shot my Christianity through full of holes. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I don't have this right. And I walked away. And two years later, three years later, and, and a whole bunch of sorrow later, I, I came to my senses and realized, no, I, that wasn't right. And so I went back home to Stephenville and uh, got involved in the Baptist Student Union at Tarleton. And uh, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Not from the Baptist, by the way. <laughs> and and um, walked with the Lord for a while. And then a two-legged uh, temptation with a dress came along, and I quit walking with the Lord. Because all I had was good Christianity. I did not have excellent Christianity. And I'm telling you, it will take excellent Christianity to survive spiritually and maybe even physically the things that are coming upon the earth at this time and in the near future. And I want to say, excellent Christianity has always, in my opinion, been what this church has tried to promote. Uh, from the very beginning, uh, there was a, a word from the Lord that was given to Owen and Irene Cain back in the early 70s. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to read parts of it. And this is what it says. Your trumpet has a sure and certain sound as only one divinely given has. Sound the notes clear and distinctly. Satan's hosts are well prepared. They will fight to the death, and death they will receive because I prepare a people. I prepare a people who shall rise up, who shall rise up from their tombs of religion and denominationalism and take my banner and begin to move out, led by my spirit. This is the beginning of the great and terrible day of the Lord. I'm preparing an army, but I'll not send my army unprepared. First, they shall undergo extensive training. They shall know perfect discipline, perfect obedience. Like Gideon's army, not all who answer the call shall be fit for battle. Submission is the key. Perfect submission to my every command. Perfect trust and perfect faith. You are entering into a new place. Things 
that have been are being changed. A new day has dawned. I have given you a vision, a vision of my most precious and cherished hope. You have caught the vision, and I shall enlarge it in your heart. Have I not shown you things no human eye has ever seen before? Have I not shown you things beyond this world? But there is more. I have planted you in a new place. Now, this word was given in June of 1974. And, Father, I pray that, that we not lose that divine mandate that you so clearly stated back then to those who founded this church, that we will continue to submit ourselves to that uh, extensive training <coughs> so that we will learn perfect trust and perfect submission and perfect obedience. And that we will be or become like Gideon's band. That, 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 that our calling will be like theirs. And let me say this about that about Gideon's band. We're going to cover that in great detail uh, going forward from here, between now and Thanksgiving, I guess. I don't know. There's a lot to that, to the story of Gideon in uh, Judges chapter 6 through 8. We're going to talk about why judgment comes to God's people and what it means when God sends judgment. And you'll get to meet your neighbors the Midianites, and we will learn more about our new identity in God, and we'll learn what God requires, part one would be to be doers of the word, and part two would be to be iconoclasts. Now, that's a big two-bit word. Basically, it means one who destroys idols, okay? And we'll see who God calls for this assignment. And we'll learn how we can make the cut. And we'll see how to defeat the enemy using the weapons of warfare that are not carnal. And we will see that God doesn't intend to leave anybody out. But there is a danger in success, and that's why the mighty fall. But God is the reason for our being. We're going to talk about all of this. Not today. <laughs> but anyway, first we're going to talk about why judgment comes to God's people. Turn in your Bible to Hosea chapter... Um, no, don't go there. Go to Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> why, God, why judgment comes to God's people. Daniel chapter 8, verse 23 in the Amplified Bible. At the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached the fullness of their wickedness, taxing the limits of God's mercy, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark trickery and craftiness shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall corrupt and destroy astonishingly, and he shall prosper and do his own pleasure. And he shall corrupt and destroy the mighty men and the holy people, the people of the saints. And through his policy, he shall cause trickery to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart and mind, and in their security, in their security, mind you, he will corrupt and destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken, but that by no human hand. And go to Daniel chapter 11. Verse 32. And such as violate the covenant, he, this 
keen understanding dark trickery. Those who violate the covenant, he shall pervert and seduce with flatteries. But the people who know their God shall prove themselves strong and shall stand firm and do exploits for God. And they who are wise and understanding among the people shall instruct many and make them understand, though some of them and their followers shall fall by the sword and flame. You see what's going on in California these days? By captivity and plunder for many days. Now when they fall, they shall receive a little help. But many shall join themselves to them with flatteries and hypocrisy. You do understand we're talking about the body of Christ here. Okay. And some of those who are wise, prudent, and understanding shall be weakened and fall. That then would in so that the insincere among the people lose courage and become deserters. It will be a test to refine, to purify, to make those among God's people white, even to the time of the end because it is yet for the time that God has appointed. And you know, we talk about this from a New Testament perspective as well, uh, because this is end time prophecy there, even though it was in the Old Testament. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we read this often. But I want you to put this in the context of what I just read there in Daniel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, Let no one deceive or beguile you in any way, for the day of the Lord will not come except the apostasy comes first. That great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, who is the son of doom, a son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently against and over all that is called God or that is worshipped, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. And there's some more explanation in this chapter of how that would work. How, how then can Christians, now, you know, the implication might be in the Amplified that, well, these were Christians in name only. Well, there are a lot of those in this world, but it wouldn't necessarily be that they're Christians in name only. They might be good Christians, but they're able to be deceived. Because in verse 9 it says the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and working of Satan and will be accompanied by great power and with all sorts of miracles and signs and delusive marvels, all of them lying wonders. You know, some in the body of Christ believe and, and teach that uh, the, the acid test of what true, excellent Christianity is, is if there's miracles happening in that place. Well, this tells you that doesn't prove. That does not prove it. It's not to say God doesn't want miracles to happen. I mean, Mark 16, 17 still applies. They that believe in Jesus will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And if they eat, drink any deadly thing, it'll not harm them. Uh, that, that all still applies. That did not pass away with the first century. But the devil is a plagiarist. He is a counterfeit. He's not original. He's not creative. He can only take what is there and twist and pervert it into something else. That's why I like to say it's all true except the part that isn't. And that part that isn't is what will kill you. Verse 10. By unlimited. See that word? Unlimited. That means God has stepped out of the way by unlimited seduction to evil with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. This tells you why good Christians can apostatize. They are perishing 
because they did not welcome the truth. Now, we've been taught from day one around here that this anointed by the Holy Spirit, rightly divided and accurately presented is the truth. But in a lot of churches, they don't teach that. Or they teach that and then one's experience. That's how you get deceived. They did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it that they might be saved. Therefore, God sins upon them a misleading influence. We'll talk about this in the next message. I'm not going to go into detail about that. There is some truth there to be ferreted out. But God sends upon them a misleading influence, a working of error and a strong delusion to make them believe what is false in order that all may be judged. This is what I want you to see right here. All may be judged and condemned who did not believe in and adhere to and trust in the truth, but rather took pleasure in unrighteousness. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. There are some parts of the body of Christ where it's popular to say, uh, and, and they will back this up with scripture. This is something you need to understand. Every false doctrine is backed up with Scripture. If, if we're talking about within the context of Christianity. In fact, it's amazing how many atheists will try to use the Bible to prove there is no God. Anyway, that just shows you the power of the Word of God. That it's so powerful that the devil will even use it to try to deceive people. But anyway, it says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, it says, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. Well, the false doctrine is Jesus was judge, and so if you believe in him, you don't come under judgment. There's no judgment for you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. Well, then wipe this verse out of the Bible. It says it's time for judgment to begin, not at Jesus Christ, but at the house of God. That's you and me. It's time for us to get judged. Well, the bell, no, 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 no. Jesus bore that for me. I'm not, I'm not accepting judgment. You better accept judgment because if you don't accept judgment, you don't get justice. If you don't accept judgment, you don't get deliverance. If you don't accept judgment, you don't get victory. You get defeat. I know, I've been there. I, I, you know, when I started getting, when, when it started to not be comfortable for me to be a Christian, twice in my life I walked away. And I will not do it again. Shoot me in the head if you see me doing it. The time has begun for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us, now let me stop right here. Some will say, well, yeah, but that was written 2,000 years ago. It began then. It hasn't been completed. You know, Steve talked, he talked about this Friday night, that uh, Israel is going to be saved when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Well, a lot of Bible translations say, well, that's the full number of, of non-Jews that are going to get saved. Well, that's not what that word fullness, pleroma, means. It means the the being full of something. So the body of Christ is not yet full of Jesus. There's varying degrees of fullness I see among Christians, but I don't see enough Jesus in me. And, and it, with all due respect, I don't see enough Jesus in you. We all need more. Okay, so... Just because that judgment began 2,000 years ago, the process is not yet complete. In the, in the wide sweep of history, sometimes things take a long time to work out. You know, that's why we are still seeing social unrest in this country involving the races 160 years after a war was concluded that supposedly settled that question. 
Just saying, sometimes things take a long time to work out. So, yes, it began back then in the first century, but it's still going on. In fact, it's coming to its fullness now. And it says, and if it began with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of Christ? Malachi chapter 3. This is all introduction, by the way. Yes. As we see in the New Testament, actually described, one of the things it described was the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, we've talked before about how prophetic scripture in the Old Testament usually does not just have one single fulfillment. It may have a, a big global fulfillment, but then it can be relevant to an individual person's life. Okay, well this is one of those. It did apply to John the Baptist, but he's not the only one that this passage of Scripture applies to. After all, you know, the Word does say there's no uh, prophecy of Scripture that is just of a single private interpretation. Okay, so read this as this is God talking about us. Malachi 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in the former years. And I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away the alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. So it's saying, in, a, in essence, that judgment of God's people is a good thing, that it is necessary, that it is vital. Now, it is within this context that we're going to be studying the life and ministry of Gideon. Turn to Judges chapter 6. Now, if, if you were listening to that prophecy I brought forth from, from 1974 for Owen and Irene Cain, you notice that there was a mention of Gideon's army in there. And I remember Owen frequently making reference to that, that he was looking for Gideon's band of 300. Well, whether we look at that as a metaphor or whether we look at that as a literal number, if it's a literal number, then we're going to have to have a bigger place than this one. Now, I don't know if rushing wind in Jacksboro can accommodate 300, but that's beside the point. Uh, what, what Gideon's band did, and what Gideon did, is what we are focusing on. Judges chapter 6. Let me just read this down, and then I'll go back and comment on some things. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them from to, into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves dens and caves and strongholds which are in the mountains. And so it was when whatever Israel had sown, Midian would come up and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, 
and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land and destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But you have not obeyed my voice. God did warn them before they even entered into the land what would happen if they uh, did what they did. You know, they couldn't say they weren't warned. For example, go to Joshua chapter 23. Moses warned them, and then Joshua warned them. When they, when they finally got there, before he sent them on their way saying, live long and prosper, he said, but, you better keep obeying the Lord. Because if you don't, well, let's read it. Joshua 23, verse 13. He says, Know for certain that the Lord your God, if you don't obey the Lord, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out those nations before you but they shall be snares and traps to you and scourges on your sides and thorns in your eyes. And you shall perish from the good land which the Lord your God has given you. <clears throat> there, verse 11, Therefore, take careful heed to yourself that you love the Lord your God. Or else... If indeed you go back and cling to the remnant of these tribes, these that remain among you, and make marriages with them, and go into them and they to you, then that's when you will know for certain that the Lord will no longer drive them out. Well, you know, we see in verse 11 the, the remedy. What was that? To love the Lord your God. Now, that was what Jesus said the greatest commandment in the, in the law was, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, if you've tried to do that, you realize how hard it is. It's not something that a person can just decide they're going to do. They have to have God's help. And we do see that <clears throat> when the children of Israel got in trouble, over and over through the Old Testament, they did cry out to God for help. And he always helped them. He did not leave or forsake them. <clears throat> Even though he threatened them with these dire consequences. <clears throat> but loving the Lord is not optional. Keep the place here. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, one might be thinking, I'm, I'm not trying to put thoughts in your head, but one might be thinking, <clears throat> well, if I have to be commanded to love somebody or something, then there's a problem. Well, yeah. yeah. But here, here's the problem. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. I'll read this in the Amplified. It says, if anyone does not love the Lord, does not have a friendly affection for him, 
is not kindly disposed toward him, he shall be accursed. And then he puts this, this little end time salutation thing. He says, our Lord will come. Maranatha. He's telling us more or less the same thing that Daniel 8, 23 or 25 told us, that, that when, when things get to that point where the love of God is just absent from society, that's when the door is open for the Antichrist to come. You know, we talk here about 2 Thessalonians 2, about the verse 7 and 8 where it says, you know, restrain the Antichrist. Well, the, the lion's share of restraining the Antichrist is loving God. Go to Revelation chapter 2. You can be a good Christian and not love God. I think that was kind of my problem back in the day. In fact, honestly, I still have to work on that. And, and if you know, everybody has their particular story of how they came to where we all are at at this particular moment. Different family backgrounds, different experiences in life, different genetics and so on and so forth. But you know what? We can't use any of that as an excuse for any lack of uh, holiness or lack of devotion in our lives. Ultimately, it boils down to decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. And we can't shirk that responsibility and put it off on somebody else. You can't even say, well, you know, my preacher didn't preach the word to me correctly, and so therefore I'm deceived. This book has been here for thousands of years. Anyway, good Christians can lack the love of God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus. That's where the book of Ephesians was written to. The book of Ephesians has a lot of good stuff in it, doesn't it? Well, those, these were the people he's talking to here. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write, These things, says he, who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. This is Jesus talking. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and you cannot bear those who are evil. You have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. <laughs> They're good Christians. I mean, we'd almost be, we stopped right there, we'd almost be tempted to say they're excellent Christians. But read verse 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You know, I was talking with Ellen yesterday about the word, about how we put the word in our lives. And I, I was remembering how it was when I first started coming to Romans 8 in 1978. And, and it wasn't just me. This was a lot of us. We got recordings of Alexander Scorby reading the Bible. Either we got it on cassette or we got it on uh, LP vinyl. And I had that going in the background where in my house, the 24-7. I, I would have it going in my sleep. I even had a little, a little a, a speaker that I put under my pillow that had that going while I was sleeping. You know, some, sometimes people say, well, Ray, how come you know the Bible so well? Well, I programmed myself with it. <laughs> you could do that. Every one of you could do that. And back in the day, pretty much everybody in the church was doing that. We were selling, I mean, I think the American Bible Society is making a lot of money off of Romans 8 church because everybody was buying those sets of Alexander Scorby reading the Bible. Well, what happened since 1978? Well, as they say, a lot of water went under the bridge. And some of that water wasn't pure water of the word. Some of it was just the, the muddy water of circumstances. But anyway, point being, these were good Christians, 
but they did not have that love that they had for him at the beginning. And so he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works. I mean, they were doing works already, so he's not saying, well, you're just a bunch of lazy Christians. No, they were not lazy Christians. But what they did at the first was motivated by their love, and then as it went along, it became motivated by sheer habit. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Well, you know what that refers to. The lampstand refers to that which sheds light. We could say the lampstand is a metaphor for revelation knowledge of the things of God. And if the lampstand is removed, then you don't really know what's of God and what isn't. You know, I made mention earlier about how a lot of Christians think that, well, just because something supernatural happens in their midst, that's of God. Well, if it isn't of God, and they think it is, what does that tell you? That tells you their lampstand has been removed. They have not discerned between the clean and the unclean. You know, I remember Roy Gillock, bless his heart, he used to say, you know what, I'd rather listen to secular rock and roll than Christian rock and roll. And we said, well, well why? Because He says, because I know there's demons in that secular rock and roll, and I, if I listen to it, I know I'm in rebellion. But if I was listening to the Christian stuff, I'd think I was being holy. And the same spirit, some of the same spirits are operating there. <clears throat> That's deception. Now, I, I'm not going to define for you what you should and should not listen to. In fact, really, a lot of what we call rock and roll is just the, world, the music of the world today. It's inescapable. And just because something has a strong beat doesn't necessarily mean that it's rock and roll. But if something is trying to co-opt that style and that influence in order to be attractive to people, it's the same spirit. They're inviting the same spirit in. Okay? Like I said, I'm not going to define Christian rock and roll for you. I'm not even going to define rock and roll. Except it usually goes along with drugs and sex, but by the way. Anyway, Hosea chapter 2. You know, Joshua warned them that if they didn't love the Lord and they begin to pull in the things of the world, like, you know, what I was saying about how some, some Christians think that they've got, that, that it's a tool of evangelism to, to make yourself appear uh, likable to the world. Okay, that's making a marriage with, with the, the, the inhabitants of the land, what Joshua was warning about. All right, that's my take on it anyway. And he said, if, if you don't love the Lord and you do that, you're going to get thorns and you're going to get scourges. Well, you know what? That, that's a good thing. Because if you didn't, <clears throat> you, you might go off a cliff. You know, those things kind of warn you, hey, you know what? I, I'm not where I should be. You know, losing can be winning if it turns you around. Hosea chapter 2, verse 5. And Hosea's wife was, was not where she was supposed to be. She left him and became a prostitute. And God is talking to Hosea, um, verse 4, and he says, I will not have mercy on her children, for they are children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who conceived them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who gave me my bread and my water, my wine and my linen, my oil and my drink. You see, this is, this is the American dream here, is to go after the, the luxuries, to go after the finer things of life. And if you, if you do that and you you turn away from the Lord, then you're in harlotry. Verse 6, Therefore, behold, 
I will hedge your way with thorns, and I will wall her in so that she cannot find her paths. She will chase her lovers, but not overtake them. Yes, she will seek them, but not find them. And then she will say, well, I will go and return to my first husband, for then it was better for me than now. So hedging with thorns is not the end of the world. Now, I, I'm, of course, making the, the observation that the church of Jesus Christ in the world today is hedged with thorns. But that's, that's a God thing. Don't try to bind the devil in that. God doesn't want you to be comfortable in sin. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Second Peter two verse twenty. <clears throat> it says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they again are entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. Now some will read this and say, well, see right there, they've lost their salvation. Or else they weren't saved to begin with. Well, no, they were saved because it says uh, they came to the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can't know Jesus as your Savior if you're not saved. Come on. Okay? But it, it's almost saying like, well, they lost, you know, then they're, they're, they're doomed for eternity. It doesn't say that. Uh, there may be some that act, that actually happens to. God forbid. But it doesn't have to happen. This is just saying that, you know, if, if they had just, just been a sinner and just kind of gone on until they were really desperate and they really needed God and they wanted God more than anything else, then if they got on board at that point, uh, maybe they would not have fallen away. Sometimes people get involved in, in Christianity for cultural reasons. You know, I, I brought up some of the reasons why people can be in church. And, and they might not be bad reasons, but they're not excellent reasons. And so these people that he's talking about here, they didn't make Jesus their Savior for excellent reasons. And so it says, it would have been better for them not to have known the way than to having known it and then turned from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. I think Steve has seen that there's some hogs that, that, that kind of like to break through fences and wallow in mud. Well, that's what hogs do. And see, the flesh is a hog. The human, the, the human nature without God, which it, it involves sense and reason, it involves lust, it involves greed, all of that is a hog. And... If you quit walking with Jesus for whatever reason, to whatever degree, all of that stuff comes back in to fill the void. That's what he's warning us about here. He's not saying, well, if you backslid, you blew it, so you might as well just, just go have your fun because you're going to hell anyway. That's not what he's saying here. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 18. 
And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, this is Jesus talking, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. It sounds like a good church. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Now let me stop right there. Christians who have been involved in deliverance ministry are familiar with this name Jezebel. And there's usually kind of a, a, a list of, of characteristics that would go with that, like uh, female domination or like, um, you know, lust or, or like manipulation and so forth. All, all of that is true, but there's really a bigger picture here. Because if you go back and study in 1 Kings where uh, Ahab and Jezebel, where their kingdom went, and how come he even married her in the first place? It was political. Jezebel was the daughter of a king of a, of a neighboring country that was neighboring to Israel, and Ahab married her for political power to, to maintain the status quo. Jezebel in our world is not just feminism or, or sexual libertinism. It can involve that, but Jezebel is actually um, the, the, the watchdog of the status quo. Jezebel is, is the school marm with the stick who keeps the population in line with what the powers that be won't done in your world. And it says, they allowed that to teach. They brought that into the church. They made that wed with Christianity. The status quo. They, 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 they got that mixed up with the worship of God. And he says that's idolatry. It's not just sexual immorality, but it's eating food sacrificed to idols. It, it's, it's getting uh, belief systems that are not God that you think are God. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not. And by the way, you, you see how in the church, sexual immorality is, is winked at. You know, I talked about the Germans and how they kind of look the other way about you know, putting these undesirables to death in the gas chamber. Well, the church kind of looks the other way about sexual sin, about adultery, fornication, um, about homosexuality, about uh, pornography, about pedophilia, about, you know, all of these things like, yeah, that's in the world, and that's bad, but, but God loves us, and so we're not going to worry about all of that. Well, no, it's coming up for judgment, is what I'm saying. And he says... Um, Verse 22, indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Steve talked about this Friday night. Great tribulation is after the, the church, the, the, the true church, uh, the excellent church, the remnant, the bride of Christ, the woman and the man child who she gave birth after they finally are removed from the planet so God can pour out the bowls of wrath on planet Earth. And it says there's a vast host of Christians who die during that time. That's what he's talking about here. He says, I will cast her into great tribulation. Unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. You know what? That's already happening. The church in California has been basically shut down by the government of California. 
And those who are meeting today there are doing so in violation of their state. They're killing the church. The, the, the spirit of Antichrist is trying to kill, to devour the, the church before the man-child can come forth. And we have not come forth yet. Right? I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Well, go back to Judges chapter 6. This is where the word from the Lord to Owen and Irene came for Romans 8. And for all of us, this is where it comes in. This is, this is the, the time that we were born into. This is our mission. Your mission, should you accept it, is this. Verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the terebinth tree, which was at Ophrah, not Ophrah Winfrey, but Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite. And in another message, we're going to go through all of that and what it means. While his son Gideon threshed wheat on the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. See, it's almost like here in this condo today, it's like we're hiding from the new world order. You know, if, if those uh, anti-Christ, Antifa, all of that, if they were to burst in here, they'd probably have some of us arrested for not keeping social distance. So we're hiding from the Midianites. Verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, and this is what I'm saying to you. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. By the way, I didn't give you the title of this series of messages. Uh, you probably, this is going to be the title until I tell you otherwise. God's mighty men of valor. And that's who you are. That's who we are. Embrace that. Don't push that off. To, oh, well, I'm no, I'm not good enough. He wasn't good enough. He was hiding from the Midianites. It's not about how good you are. It's about whether you love the Lord or not. And if you don't, your way's going to get hedged up with thorns and you're going to realize, hey, I'm, I'm between uh, a rock and a hard place. Right? Well, Father, I thank you that even in judgment, there is the promise of your deliverance. And I thank you, Father, that you have showed us the way and that it, it's the way of following Jesus. That Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to God but by me. So, Lord, bring us to that place of excellence. Cause that to be our desire, that we not just be good Christians, but that we be excellent Christians. And, Father, only you can make us that. But you don't make anybody that if they don't choose it. So, Father, give us the power and the desire to become those excellent Christians, those mighty men of valor that you say that we are and that we can be. And to you be all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.